Hello and welcome to the Blockchain and Us, where pioneers and thought leaders talk about their journey in blockchain technology, crypto assets, and the token economy. And I'm your host, Manuel Staggers. If you enjoy this podcast, please give it a top rating and review on iTunes, and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Manuel Staggers. This episode is brought to you by Crypto Storage. Crypto Storage offers a proprietary solution to enable professional storage of crypto assets. The storage is secure both physically and digitally on the highest grade hardware security modules with detailed configuration possibilities for individual based access control. To learn more, visit www.cryptostorage.ch. My guest today is Tom Lyons. Tom is Executive Director of Research and Advisory at Consensus Switzerland and Chairman of the Communications Working Group at the Crypto Valley Association in Zug. Before he joined Consensus, Tom ran his own communications agency, specializing in thought leadership, content and influencer marketing strategy and execution for clients in emerging technologies, fintech and financial services with a special focus on blockchain and decentralized technology. And now to the interview. Hi, Tom, and many thanks for taking time today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Tom, you have a long background in communications in the financial sector, and now you're executive director of research and advisory at Consensus Switzerland. What do you do in that role? So at Consensus, I'm involved in, um, or I split my work up into three different areas. Um, one part of it is I'm working on something called Consensus Research, which is an effort that consensus to build up a research arm in uh, questions about decentralization. So we're not talking about research into the um, blockchain technology. We're talking more the social aspect of blockchain. And at the Consensus Research, there's kind of two pillars. We're looking to do data-driven research into the early blockchain ecosystem and also to do kind of thought leadership into questions of decentralization. So that's one part of my job. Um, I'm also involved on a consensus project working on the European Union Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which is a two-year European Commission um, project to explore the, uh, the blockchain ecosystem in Europe and to do also to do thought leadership and to kind of make a forum for exchanging ideas among experts and also the general public in Europe. And last but not least, um, since there's only three of us in consensus in Switzerland, I'm sort of the de facto consensus rep here. You know, and we're not, we're not, we're not highly active in the Swiss market right now, but I do some community stuff and, and uh, sort of f uh, fly the flag. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. In terms of thought leadership, you mentioned that a few times. Um, what is your function there? Well, thought leadership is, to be honest, um, a term that I've been using professionally for a long time and I've never liked, but it's the one that we use. And basically, thought leadership is simply, um, you know, writing about ideas that are pertinent to whatever business or, or whatever um, ent enterprise you're in. So my role is to... Um, both at the uh, Consensus Research and at the um, Blockchain Observing Forum, is to create content, either by writing, by editing, um, editing in the sense of creating, you know, getting ideas together, uh, finding people to interview, working with people. It's just um, uh, putting, you know, finding, putting together and getting out uh, good content on a lot of the important ideas around blockchain and consensus. Um, I'd like to speak a little more about that whole idea of communications, marketing and thought leadership, because I mean, that's what you're a pro in. And um, because I also think that whole area is quite hard to understand and grasp. I mean, some people might think that communications is about sending out press releases to journalists or, you know, sending emails on LinkedIn about ICOs or, or writing on Medium or having a Telegram or Twitter channel. Um and posting news there. But in your view, what is good communications? I mean, at the heart of what people like myself do, it's actually quite simple. It's simply storytelling. And it depends, um, you know, storytelling for in different contexts and, and for different reasons. And any any good communications will will tell a story of some kind. And that's really the skill you need to be 
you need to be the most in touch with. Now, there are different kinds of stories out there. There's true stories, there are fake stories, there's propaganda, there are inspiring stories, there's all sorts of different um, ways to approach it. But at the end of the day, that's pretty much what, uh, what it's all about. But with, with consensus, what kind of stories do you tell about that company? So there's two major things going on with a company like Consensus, but I would probably say with any any blockchain effort at this point, right? There's two things happening. We're developing a new technology, okay? So there are a lot of stories to tell about this technology itself. Um, and blockchain technology is a little bit different than other kinds of important uh, emerging t emergent technologies or technologies we've seen emerge in the past because it has a large social component to it. Um, it has aspirations to change society. So there's a lot of stories about how and why blockchain, uh, how blockchain works, why it's important. Um, that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of it is we're all trying to build businesses. So there are stories about our businesses, um, our efforts, uh, how we work, what we're doing and why that you want to be telling. Mm -hmm. How do you go about, you know, finding the right narrative to, you know, for those different stories? I mean, that's an interesting question. So I, I worked for, you know, long before I came to Consensus, I worked for many years in corporate communications, and that's basically telling the story of a company, okay? But, but sorry to interrupt yeah, no, sure. there. I mean, the story about a company, right? I mean, you could have the founder's journey, or you could have this company does X, and that's why it's better than the other companies. And, and then you have something maybe deeper where you say, look, there's something very important happening here in the world. And our company is at the, at the forefront of this development, something like that. I mean, there's many, many ways to, to find stories to tell about a company. So I'm, I'm just wondering which ones you focus on with, uh, I mean, in your, in your work. Sure. It all has to do with um, who you're talking to, number one, and what you're trying to say. And I think one of the things that, that I, and also people who do what I do well, um, have to do or often find themselves having to do with people that, who want to tell their story is to set the context. Because a lot of people somehow forget that. Now, for me, it's second nature, right? To think about, okay, who are we talking to? What do they know? What do they not know? And, you know, trying to find a way to make this relevant and important to them. And A lot of people I notice who d maybe don't come from that way of thinking or don't have that experience tend to jump into the middle of what they're trying to say and, and, and throw it at you. And I'm always mm, – so I guess my commandment number one is, is understand who you're talking to and give them a reason um, to, to be interested in what you're saying so that that's all about context. Is there an example that you can give? Well, the example I – mean, the best example right now, of course, and maybe we'll talk about this in detail, is the whole blockchain story. Right, because you're talking about this wild new technology, which once you get it, okay, you can understand why it could very well be very important. But it's basically solving a lot of problems that most people don't know they have. So, you know, how are you going to make that interesting to them, right? So, how, you know, what you know, what's the context of of this whole thing? I mean, when you start talking about blockchain, we start talking about you know theories of money. We start talking about. Um, Uh, exchanges of value, transactions. We talk about you can talk about the, the the plumbing of the financial system. All fascinating stuff, but not stuff that most people have ever really thought about, or or really cared about. Right. And again, like you said before, right? Who do you talk to? I mean, if you speak about you know reinventing the plumbing of the financial system, somebody in finance may find that interesting or may not want to hear about it. Right. And, and so, but I think the main focus with a lot of the blockchain narratives that I observe out there are really about explaining this technology to people who may not already know about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, how do you do that best? So of course that's the uh, that's the question that I've been struggling with for the past three years or so <laughs> since I fell down the uh, <laughs> blockchain rabbit hole. But I would say the way I like to approach Now, when I talk to somebody who's maybe um, doesn't have a technical background or hasn't really be, um, come across blockchain before is to say, look, this is a technology that allows people who either do not know each other or who do know each other but don't trust each other, perhaps because they're competitors or, or even enemies, it allows them to agree on and share information directly with each other without having to rely on some sort of trusted third party. 
And it's actually the agree on part that I think is the most important part because we've been able through the internet and, and various other um, communications means to share information for quite a long time. But in order for strangers or adversaries to um, actually be able to agree on information and use it in a trusted way, you've before blockchain had to find some sort of third party, some sort of authority to keep and verify and share the information for you. And this is, I mean, this has worked for a very long time, but it can lead to certain kinds of problems. With blockchain, you can do this directly through the technology and directly um, uh, there's means in the technology to come to consensus on information and means that the technology gives you to uh, save this information in such a way that you know that it can't be um, changed later. So nobody can really cheat in such a system, but you don't need a third party to do it for you. Mm -hmm. But I mean, do you think that's a narrative that's easy to understand? I think when I get this far, um, if the person is still listening, <laughs> um, then I try to get to the second part is why does that matter? Mm -hmm. Because that's obviously, that's obviously the, um, the real kicker. And if the person does seem to continue to be interested, then I'll say, look, this doesn't sound like much on the surface of it when you talk about it that way. Basically, we're talking about a brand new database technology, a brand new accounting technology. So that doesn't sound very exciting. But it turns out if you can share trusted information, you can start to do some very interesting and a lot of people people think very important things. Just to give a couple of examples, if you have trusted, uh, shared trusted information, you can have money without banks, which is the first use case for blockchain through Bitcoin. And you can do financial transactions without intermediaries. But you can also do things like build systems where um, an individual can get more control over their personal data and their personal reputation online instead of having to rely on a Google or a Facebook. You can do things like build, you know, large global direct peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces where people um, buy and sell and, and, and exchange things directly between each other without having to use an Amazon or an eBay. So making Amazons and Ebays without Amazon and eBay. Um, you can do things like set up platforms where you have true sharing economies. So Ubers and Airbnbs without the Uber and Airbnb. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there are certain there's a number of reasons why that could be interesting. Number one is if you get rid of middlemen, then you're going to reduce costs because there's not a cost there. Um, there's nobody in the middle um, taking a fee. But also, if you look at these um, broad-based direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer marketplaces, they tend to be much more inclusive. So it's easy to get onto them. So it's a broader base of people that can, that can, that can use it. And we're talking about whether in develop, developed uh, parts of the world or what's very interesting with blockchain, blockchain is the way it could potentially give access to global markets to, um, to people who are right now not banked or just really out of, really out of the whole uh, global system. Mm -hmm. How do you usually go about explaining what what uh, your company, what consensus does? Here too, I have to split it into two parts. Okay, so consensus the um, consensus the business is today. I think it's fair to say probably the largest um, blockchain focused company in the world. We've got at last count over eight hundred people in twenty eight countries around the world, and we're focused on building decentralized applications as well as. Um, products and services and infrastructure um, almost exclusively on the Ethereum platform. So it's kind of like a huge, um, we call ourselves a venture studio. So one way to look at it is like a very large um, venture capital firm, except it's not like a VC fund. The, the, the projects we get behind are, are actually tend to be much more closely integrated into the company than in a typical VC fund. But we, we, we find, incubate, grow, and, 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 and bring to market um, a, a lot of, comp a lot of uh, projects that are doing interesting decentralized applications on Ethereum for all sorts of use cases, from financial use cases to energy, to entertainment, to supply chain, to, to you name it. But we also do, um, or we also have an arm that does uh, consulting. Uh, we have an educational arm. So we're doing those kind of services. Um, we do direct investments. There's a something called Consensus Capital, which does uh, in, investing into into companies um, or also kind of 
also brings in and incubates um, projects that may not be part of the consensus family yet. And consensus also does a lot of stuff on the Ethereum infrastructure. So we do a lot of open source projects. These are not generally not-for-profit initiatives of consensus that are building out developer tools for Ethereum or, um, you know, we do MetaMask, which is an Ethereum browser, that kind of thing. So that's the one side of the, of the, uh, of the equation. To me, the other pillar, and this is a very personal take on consensus, is it's one of the largest and greatest um, experiments in decentralization in t inside an organization that you'll ever come across. So we run ourselves, um, I mean, we, we, we walk the walk and talk the talk, or at least we try to inside consensus. It's a decentralized organization on a large scale. Um, I don't have a boss. Um, we're allowed to self-organize. And it's, um, it's something you have to see. Uh, and have to experience. It's a fascinating experiment. And certainly a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. I mean, you, you know, I think a lot of times when I talk, mention to people about a decentralized organization, or I say we're self-organizing, I say, well, I don't have a boss. And well, I can, you know, I'm a, I have a lot of latitude to choose my team and to change teams and get involved in projects. And everyone thinks, boy, now there, <laughs> right, is a ticket to do nothing and get paid. Hmm. My experience so far with myself and with a lot of the people I deal with, it's, it's been the opposite. I've been taking on too much. You know, there's so many fascinating things going on and I want to be a part of this and I want to be a part of that. Um, and I think most of the people in the company are probably the same way. So the real issue is 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 the discipline to, to focus. I would say my first uh, five, six months full time, that, that's been probably my, my, my number one takeaway. How did you manage that to focus? I've, well, over the last, I'll be honest, over the last four to six weeks, I've been pruning. I've been, I've been pruning my own little portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean... I guess one thing that's interesting that's probably been helpful for me is that I was uh, I was on my own for eight years. So I had a little, a small little communications agency, basically a freelancer plus a network thing. And I was, had to be very self-directed. So inside consensus, it's kind of like I have my little projects and my little clients inside, but you have to, um, I have to keep an eye on my portfolio and what I promise people, because the worst thing to do is to promise something and not be able to, uh, to follow up. Is there a vision or an overarching vision at Consensus? Absolutely. So Consensus is um, a very idealistic place. And I, I use that word carefully because that, that can sound a bit, um, that can sound a bit off-putting. But there's a, a large streak of idealism all through the whole blockchain industry. It's one of the things that struck me right away when I first got involved. And... Um, There's this whole idealism and, and vision around decentralized structures, decentralized economic, social, and political structures that could be supported by blockchain. And consensus has a very clear vision to support that. Okay, yes, we're Ethereum-focused, but we want to build up the apps and the, in the infrastructure to support decentralized um, markets, decentralized social structures, decentralized um, or important um you know, socioeconomic structures do it in a decentralized way because we think that there are, there's a lot to be said for that. We think that there's, um, that in, in many cases, it's something the world probably needs and certainly could profit from. Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this at Consensus Switzerland? So I got involved in Consensus actually last August, so August 2017, but only part-time. So um, they basically they were a client of mine for a while. And I joined full-time January 1 of this year. I mean, you said you joined about a year ago, right? So, um, but that vision probably existed before that already. So I'm wondering um, if you have a company that's decentralized in the way that consensus is, and uh, people are spread over so many locations and countries, how do you make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of vision? No, that's an excellent question. It's a, it's a central question to these kind of organizations. Inside Consensus, we have an incredibly, I mean, I have discovered an incredible culture of sharing information. So we have a lot of online tools. Um, we have Slack and, 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 and various other tools where people are very, very community oriented. And I think that's a function of the kind of people who are attracted to a place like Consensus. And I think it's a function of the fact that we are um, spread all over the world because not only is Consensus 
present in in like 28 countries or something, but it's a remote first company. So of those 800 or maybe it's even 900 by now people, um, I believe if I'm not mistaken that the majority of them or at least more than half of them work remotely anyway. So it's it's all these sort of little, you know, little nodes, which kind of sounds blockchain like, doesn't it? Little nodes all over the place, you know, doing the work. So we're very much... Um, geared towards sharing information towards various community channels there's a lot of video video chats and video calls we have company wide calls we you know we do a lot of that so there's that obviously there's material in that you get um, that you can make use of and there's there's the the public facing consensus media which is our thought leadership arm and um, I have to say I think it's excellent and you know not only can can we internally read that but but externally as well it's all there so a lot of we, we do a lot of publishing about what we're up to there's that and then this com- this company is very much um, representative of its founder, of of Joe Lubin, who founded it, and he's very active. You can you can I mean, he gives a lot of talks, and he's on YouTube, and you can you know you can um you can get a good sense rather quickly if you look for it for for what he's thinking. And I think the the, the you know a lot of us. I guess we wouldn't be there if we didn't kind of be on the same page as that. So those are those are the kind of ways. I haven't I haven't necessarily had issues or saw a lot of issues internally where we are in terms of sharing this vision. I think you might get into you know there's other aspects where you talk about you know sh- sharing information specific to a certain project or stuff like that where where um where you could think in a large decentralized organization that could be an issue. But to be honest, when you're on a project, you're dealing with a, a, a finite group of people. So then it becomes quite easy to share. Mm-hmm. I sometimes speak with companies who say, oh, you know, we need a stronger vision or we need to be visible and we need to make sure people get us right away when we tell them what we do in an elevator pitch. How important do you think that is in this whole blockchain field? It's important in any field. When I was a communications consultant, I'd go in to talk to people and I'd say, um, you're about to pay me a whole bunch of money. Well, it wasn't even that much. But anyway, you're about to pay me a whole bunch of money for me to write you one page. Okay? What? Well, but what we're going to talk about for whatever the workshop is or however long it takes is to get you a, um, a good short, what are you talking with? They used to call a slogan, mm-hmm. to get you a one sentence, to get you a, a one paragraph, your elevator pitch, and to get you a one page description Something of what like you do. Something like a mission statement. Like or a mission statement. statement. Yeah. But, but one that covers everything you want to do mm-hmm. or you want to say and all the audiences you're talking to. That's not easy. If you get that, you're off to the races. Then you can start building out from that. So I spend a lot of time with uh, with people working on on basic messaging and it can, it can be very interesting i mean you know you talk to uh you know you, you talk to developers and, and technology types sometimes and you say okay so so what does your um what does your app do and you start getting all this techno speak back you know well it's got an improved consensus mechanism in order to you know do with the api and, and, and i said what does it do well you know we've got you know you double the speed in it i said what does it do <laughs> okay. you know and and try to get it back to towards talking about you know the, the function and purpose i mean i'm you know what i just said was a bit was a bit exaggerated because there are plenty of technologists who are ex- extremely eloquent about what they do but sometimes you get this with with projects and startups you know to get a, you know you know it's hard to take that step back and and look at the purpose and it's it's not a, it's a more difficult process than people think i mean i've done these workshops and and you know i i once went to a workshop and I said, you know, I'm here, I'm a communications consultant, and my, um, you know, my qualification for this job is that I'm dumber than most trees. Okay, what's that mean? And what it means is I'm here to ask very simple, naive questions. That's what it means, you know. And I said, what? And I said, no, no, okay, that's exaggerated, but I'm here to ask you very simple questions um, and to not know anything. And that's where you have to start. And then? And then you start, and then, um, and then usually, usually it's usually it's good. I mean, I like to talk to people. You know, it it depends how the conversation goes. But but if if you're getting stuck, then I'll say, okay, if we, if we can't get right to the heart of it, then tell me what are what are your favorite, you know, what are your important themes in your work? You know, what what are the subjects that that surround this thing you're doing that you find important? So that's one of them. Or we can talk about 
um, you know, if, if they're really product oriented, I'll say, well, what's your, what's your product and, 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 and why did you make it? Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. And then, and then it, you know, goes back, go back to that. So there's different ways in, but you're trying to get to some, some basic messages, um, that, that, that somebody from the outside would, would understand. I mean, I'm quite sure that many of these goals that people have and, you know, visions that they, what they want to do are quite similar, right? They want to be thought leader in the space and cutting edge technology and always putting the, you know, client at the center or things like this, maybe in in the financial sector. But how do you, how do you differentiate between different offerings? Well, that's, that's also a very good question. There's different ways to think about that. First of all, you often have this problem, and I see this problem a lot in blockchain right now, mm-hmm. that you, we have so many startups and, and, and so many people coming, you know, projects that are dealing with the same use case, right? And sometimes I feel sorry because, you know, somebody will come up with this idea. So I've got this amazing idea for this use case, and I have to keep it to myself that there's already, you know, 10 others doing the same thing. So there's that part of it, but also outside of blockchain, this idea of, of how do you differentiate is really important. And that's one of the things you need to concentrate on. It, to be honest with you, there are cases when you don't. There are simply cases when you cannot. And in such a case, I say, that's fine. Then we won't differentiate on the offering. We'll differentiate on the way you present it, on being trustworthy, um, you know, maybe... You know, it's one thing if five companies are doing the same thing, but who's doing it well or the best or in a way that, that somebody would be interested in. So, um, you know, let's, let's be, you know, let's just be straightforward and, and, and believable and, and honest about what we're doing. And maybe that'll, that'll help differentiate us. So it depends. But you do try to look for the thing that is different. And obviously you would have thought that, that the people developing the product at the beginning would have been thinking about that. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. What's your verdict there in the blockchain space? Do you think people think about those uh, things or not? Well, I've seen everything so far. I mean, I think, like I said, there's a lot of, you see a lot of people popping up with, you know, they're very enthusiastic about their use case and there's going to be other ones, you know, doing the same thing. Other times you come across uh, interesting twists on it. Um, right now in in the blo- in terms of blockchain infrastructure, we're seeing a lot of uh, people working on, on, on blockchain basics and taking different tacks. So it's really a case by case basis. Um, you know, having, having that, having that message is, is one thing, but then there's communications, there's marketing, there's thought leadership, there's advertising. I mean, how do you use those things to get that message out? So I've been using this this uh, awful term thought leadership all these years because it, it does encapsulate um, w- one basic difference and, and one thing that I've been thinking about in my work for quite a while. So I would put it this way, in, in, in our world today, Okay, almost everything we do and almost everything that a company does or that that a business does is somehow tech related. Okay, and because because, you know, software is eating the world. There's just no doesn't seem to be any doubt about that. So it's somehow technology related. So and technology is complex. Okay, and these technologies we're building, whether it's blockchain, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's um, all the various different kinds of technologies surrounding surrounding all the data we're producing these days, um, not even to talk about biotech, which is a whole other subject. So, so all these technologies are complex, and they have they tend to have um, a real sort of sort of claim to be able to transform large parts of society, okay, and how we do things, okay? So all of a sudden, you're into the realm, a realm of ideas, okay? Um, you have ideas going on that have to do with this complex technology and how it works and, and what it's going to do to your life, and you have ideas about how the world is going to be changed, okay? Now, I don't think this was necessarily the case in the past. I mean, obviously, when we had, you know, when when the railroads came in, let's say, or when automobiles came in and things, are, you know, and, and, you know, we had mobility and we had, we had communications technologies, things were changing and changed and changed dramatically. But I mean, the, 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 the speed and the, 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 the magnitude of the change, in my opinion right now, is, is much more than we've ever seen and it's only getting faster. So you have right now in, in a lot of this kind of world, you're dealing in a world of ideas and thought leadership is about explaining those ideas and, 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 um, 
and exploring them, right? We, you see this in blockchain all the time. So you can do marketing and you can, you know, try to get your story out in terms of, in terms of, um, you know, your product and what you do, or you can try to get it out in terms of why you do and why you do what you do and why it matters. And that's the difference between, to me, between communications and marketing and this thought leadership thing. Mm -hmm. What kind of channels do you, do you use? All the standard ones. I mean, we're living in an age right now of, um, almost paradoxically with, with all our video stuff gone, this is an age of words. Okay. This is a great age to be a writer, a great moment to be somebody who likes to write. It's, it's fantastic. We have all the blogs and we have all these different platforms and, you know, Twitter and, and all this stuff. Yes, you have a lot of, um, you know, we, we have a lot of stuff on video. You have YouTube, but most YouTube videos in, in our space are people talking, right? So it's all about ideas and words. And, and that's, you know, those are the channels. So Medium, LinkedIn, Medium, LinkedIn. I mean, Medium's great. LinkedIn, um, whatever, whatever little blog you have. And now we have all the chat channels going on, the social stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm personally, but this is just me, you know, from where I come from. I'm personally attracted to, to more towards actual writing, you know, to, to, to short and long form writing as opposed to, as opposed to social. But then again, I'm just old school. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think many more people read these long articles than we think. You know, I mean, um, I made lots of videos and there was there were always people who said, your, your videos are way too long. Nobody's going to watch an hour of an interview. But you know what? Some people watched it and they watched all of it and really liked, you know, some parts that maybe happened toward the end of the interview. And so you'll always have somebody looking at it and appreciating it as opposed to only, you know, the very short snippets. No, I, I, I agree hundred percent, but even if it's, even if it's short form stuff, you know, there's, I mean, there's just, you know, p people are reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think the traditional channels, you know, of marketing and advertising, do you think they still work today? If, if I'm not mistaken, if you look at the studies, they actually still do. Let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. Crypto Storage is part of the Crypto Finance Group, providing services for professional financial intermediaries and therefore bridging the gap between traditional markets and blockchain technology. The storage solution offered by Crypto Storage raises market standards by introducing a new security paradigm, which features two layers of dedicated and redundant hardware devices. This setup allows for a dedicated, independent and highly flexible multi-signature framework. All transactions can be independently reviewed and approved on a dedicated tamper-proof hardware. The hardware security module, the tamper-proof signing devices, and the tailored software solution are all developed by leading Swiss providers with vast experience in finance and IT security. To learn more, visit www.cryptostorage.ch. If, if I'm not mistaken, if you look at the studies, they actually still do. To, to a certain extent. But I don't think that's applicable to the blockchain world right now. Another thing we're dealing with in, in, in blockchain is... We're How do you mean it's not applicable? Because we, we're not consumer-facing yet. Got it. Okay. We're, we're not, you know, we're, we're building something. I mean, the, the, the main community right now that we're talking to is each other, okay, which is important, right? And... And to in the important, what you know, the word I hate, but I use uh, stakeholders, um, governments and investors and, and, and that kind of thing. But we're not, we're not um, public or consumer facing yet. And where we are public facing, it's in my opinion, for the wrong reasons. It's all the ICOs and cryptocurrency stuff. It's not the technology. That will change. Is there maybe a new kind of engaging people and getting them excited Uh, on the horizon for this technology? Um, the blockchain idea and, and blockchain technology, at least in theory, can let us set up a, hub, a lot of new paradigms in advertising as it does in, in, in most other things. And again, we're talking about moving from centralized sort of push advertising, uh, like your traditional television or, or radio, or whatever it is, to, to more decentralized models um, and more direct peer-to-peer -peer models. And that can get very, very interesting. I mean, we, we, we sort of have that now, in, or people think they do, because we have all this data mining and, and, and all this, you know, crazy... Um, all this crazy online um, advertising things going on with Google, et cetera, and, 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 you know, targeted, you know, targeted advertising based on whatever data they've stolen from you. So that's the one thing in, in the blockchain world, I think 
the the idea is to be able to move to much more much more of an equal playing field let's say or 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 a, a um a level playing field between the advertiser and let's call it the advertisee okay and this gets into the whole idea of self sovereign identity and having the individuals more in control of their personal data such that you can set up systems where you basically negotiate with an advertiser and you know say look i'm i'm willing to either um I'm willing to give you my information for maybe you charge them for it or, you know, you have it, – it, it's more of a two-way discussion because it's not like advertising is, is a priori bad, right? Um, in my personal opinion, what, a, what is a priori bad is just sucking up all sorts of information about whatever targets you're looking to advertise to and, and abusing that information. But if it's something that I'm interested in or there's other sort of structures where I can, I can advertise – what I want to be advertised about and, and willing to make choices about, about the information I share, then I think that's fine. In fact, it could be very, very useful to me as a person. So I think we're starting to, to look towards building those kind of structures. And again, we get back to this blockchain idea of trusted shared information without intermediaries. You can start to, uh, to look at those kind of systems, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd like to ask... I'd like to speak about a slightly different topic, which is the place that we're in currently, which is Switzerland, um, because Consensus is based in New York, I think, right? Yeah, the main office is in Brooklyn. The main office, right. But uh, you're in Switzerland. So how come? Well, I'm in Switzerland personally because um, because I can be. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can be, you should be, as far as I'm concerned when it comes to Switzerland. Now, I was uh, I was born and raised in the United States in New York City, but my mother's Swiss, and so I have a, I have a dual citizen, and I came here 25 years ago. So um, um, I didn't come to Switzerland for a consensus, uh, but I was very happy to be able to work for them when they're here. Um, consensus actually has a kind of a history with Switzerland that a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of. So it's um, technically it's a Swiss company. Also, Consensus AG is registered in Zug in Switzerland. It's the holding company. Okay, And, interesting. I didn't um, know. Oh yeah, and it's very much connected with the whole um, Ethereum founding of Ethereum, the Ethereum Foundation, which is also here in Switzerland. So the consensus history with the country. You know, you, you could say it kind of goes back to, to also to the founding of the Ethereum Foundation here. And, uh, but the, for various reasons, we haven't been particularly active in Switzerland. There's actually three of us. So you're talking right now to one third of consensus Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Do you think uh, Switzerland is a good place for blockchain companies? I think it's a fantastic place for blockchain companies. It's not perfect, but it's fantastic. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Like what? Okay, so there's – here again, um, there's two things I'd like to concentrate on. One is Switzerland is a pretty good place, um, in many ways an excellent place to start a blockchain business. That's because you have um, a relatively – blockchain friendly government certainly in the in the uh, city and canton of zug but also in the rest of switzerland they're interested interested in this technology they want to support it um the swiss uh, economics minister recently came out and said that we're going to build switzerland into crypto nation um zug has been known for quite a long time as crypto valley it has an extremely high number of blockchain startups um it It's uh, the home of an extremely high number of ICOs, um, but it also has a, a growing and very interesting ecosystem around blockchain in terms of blockchain expertise, whether it's legal or tax or marketing. Um, we have great universities uh, who do a lot of interesting stuff with blockchain, the ETH, Lucerne University of Applied Sciences. So in, in my opinion, in Switzerland, you probably have the best mix of government support, regulatory certainty, and developed ecosystem that you're going to find. Um, anywhere else in the globe. Some places are maybe a bit more progressive on the regulatory side or a bit more, you could call them permissive. Um, some places may have, may have a larger, a larger ecosystem. But if you want the whole package in one sort of area, in one self-contained area, um, you can do a lot worse than coming here. 
And also, I mean, it's Switzerland has been, people forget this, but, but Switzerland has been a very good place for high tech for a very long time um, to build, you know, this, this is not the only um, high tech industry we, you know, we have, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it wins awards every year for the most innovative nation in the world. Um, and yeah, it's got good business reasons. Taxes are low, um, salaries are high, um, which is good if you're getting them, not so good if you're paying them. Um, so it's got a pretty strong mix, I would say. But really, in the in the blockchain story, really it's about it's about how early um, Switzerland got involved and and how much it's been behind it. And certainly, there's a lot of blockchain companies here. Oh yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, again, if you if you put on your communications hat, um, how do you see them do in terms of communications? I think if there's a very active community. I mean, we have a lot of meetups. Um, people get together. It's it's a rather social world, um, even here in Switzerland. Uh, and I don't think it's any different than any place else. But I think people are are very. I mean, what has impressed me in this whole world since I got involved in it is the the degree to which people are interested in sharing information and talking to each other and discussing what they're doing and you know meeting up and 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 getting together and connecting and there's you know, that's, that's really um, remarkable when you think about it. And it has to do with the fact that we're, you know, we're, we're new kind of movement and, 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 you know, people are, you know, people are eager, eager to connect with other people, like-minded people. And it has to do with the fact that there's a large open source history to this, to this technology. So there's that kind of, that kind of um, ethos is, is kind of part of blockchain anyway, but it's, it's remarkable, you know, you know, how, how you have this exchange going on. You know, I mean, I worked in banking for a long time and it wasn't like that. If you compare uh, what companies focus on, right, or on the stories that they tell about themselves, do you see a difference in Switzerland compared to other locations maybe in the world? I mean, you could make a case that there's less, maybe a stretch though, but you could make a case that we're, we're, we have less of that sort of, you know, rah, rah, ICO, um, you know, hype thing going on and that projects based here tend to be more sort of matter of fact, but I don't know if that would, you know, that would stand to stand examination. But yeah, I think, I think maybe there's that. There's certainly, it's not a culture where you, where you make a, that kind of noise, um, as I've seen in, in conferences in New York and other places and, and, you know, it's different kind of things going on. There was, there's actually a reason why I, why I was asking that question, because if you look at, you know, the way the press talks about cryptocurrencies, um, there's certainly a lot of scary news, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And um, I recently spoke to somebody from a news portal right here in Switzerland um, with financial news, and, and he said it's mostly the mainstream press. You know, they cling on to all kinds of sensational news to get clicks and to get views, and that's what they need. And cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and all that lends itself to that. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you take this blockchain narrative about the importance of this technology and how do you make it stronger so it can maybe override all the clickbait and all the sensational news out there? So, I mean, that is a problem, first of all, right? And I mean, I can almost understand it. You know, here, I, here I come, like we talked about before with my blockchain story. Well, we've got this fancy new database technology and we're going to make, you know, shared trusted information. And on the other hand, you know, the, the, the editor at the, at, the, at the local newspaper is seeing all this stuff about Bitcoin and ICO frenzy and dark web. I mean, wh what are you going to choose? Okay. I think personally that the, the tack you have to take certainly in a place like Switzerland, is to say, look, it may not seem very sexy right now, but we are starting to build a brand new global industry, okay? The Web 3.0 blockchain industry, okay? And it would probably be a good thing for Switzerland to be a leader in this industry, the way it has become a leader or has become very, you know, globally involved in industries from finance to pharmaceuticals to high-tech manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So we're building this important new industry. Let's not miss the boat. Forget the cryptocurrencies. Forget the ICOs. Um, you know, let's take a look at the fact that we happen to be early in and we should stay. That's how I would pitch an editor. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, we had this conversation a few weeks ago, you and me, where we said, okay, that's great. That's a nice story. And it's, you know, it's a good approach, but let's, you know, think a little bit bigger. Let's, let's say we are now driving in third gear or something and let's shift to, to fifth or sixth gear. So how would you take that narrative and supercharge it? Now you put me on the spot. My, my first instinct, to be honest with you, is to say we have to wait um, un until we have to wait until we have some national champions. We have to wait until we, we can show stuff. We have to start talking about jobs. I mean, yeah, this is not very, very sexy stuff. Or we have to wait until we have some, some, some use cases that start to happen. Now, for example, one interesting thing happened yesterday. So yesterday, um, they announced in Zoog that they had the first um, blockchain-based e-voting. Okay, now voting and Switzerland get a, go along very well together. Okay, it's an important subject here, right? Direct democracy and all this other stuff. So, you know, all of a sudden we're having this new kind of voting. Again, it's not super sexy on the surface, but you can start saying, look, these things are starting to happen, okay? And what's it going to mean for you as a citizen? Okay, all of a sudden, if you take it to its logical conclusion, we can bring direct democracy to the next level with uh, – with, um, with, you know, functioning viable decentralized e-voting systems where you can really vote, not just like we do here in Switzerland every three months, but maybe who knows every day on important issues facing you. Okay. And you can trust what's going on and you can have much more transparency in, in, in the government. So you start to get those kind of things. I have high hopes for blockchain use cases in local communities, loyalty points, kinds of things. Um, the, the Swiss really like, um, you know, clubs and, and, and these kind of things, or Ferreina, right? And also the kind of stuff. And associations. Associations, right? Swiss like associations. They like, um, you know, they like self-organizing um, kind of things. And obviously you can use blockchain to really support those kind of efforts and, and, and bring transparency and trust and, and efficiency to, to these kinds of things. And also the whole idea of loyalty points of, of, of supporting communities um, with, with, uh, with basically with their own kind of, I mean, a loyalty point is nothing other than a currency. And I have high hopes that when you start to see decentralized structures that function, that are useful in small communities, that people will get used to it, will see it, will find it important, and they'll say to themselves, well, if I can have a flat, horizontal, decentralized I mean, they won't use it in those terms, but they'll say, you know, if, if, if this kind of thing works for my community, this kind of decentralized structure works here, why wouldn't it work for my company? And then if it works in my company, why not in my country? Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me you always have to let people discover that on their own. I mean, I think people have to, and, and that's very strong, I believe, with this whole technology, people have to experience it and try, try it on their own. Yep. And, and that's why I like what you said, you know, start small, start in community, have a, have a small win, and then build from there. I mean, the, the challenge we face in the blockchain world right now is simply we don't have that much to show, okay? I don't think that's a problem. We're still in early days, okay? You have to have something to show. Now, when I go and tell people I'm a storyteller and I do all this other kind of stuff, it starts to sound like you're a spin doctor or a propagandist. But don't forget, the absolutely best story in the world is a true one. So when it's there and it works and it's useful, okay, then we'll have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. If let's say, let's say there was a startup and they have a product and it's kind of working and they want to take it to the next level and, and tell the world about it. So how would you say they should go about that? Well, theoretically, right? It, it should actually be no different than any other kind of product marketing because theoretically, you don't necessarily need to know that there's a blockchain behind it. In fact, if we do our job well, nobody will know, but they'll see the difference, okay? It'll be cheaper, it'll be more direct. Let's say you build a, a, some sort of peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, right? Where people are, are dealing directly with each other and there's a reputation system in there that, that kind of works and, and there's a, you know, you, you can do these transactions in, 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 a, in a frictionless way and you start to see that happen, all right? I mean, that's a story that will resonate. So that's what you're that's what you're touting that's what you're talking about you're not telling them it's a blockchain i mean i wouldn't tell anybody to go run out if you have a consumer facing blockchain based project to go run around and say it's blockchain hmm. because it'd be like what's that okay tell them you know there has to be something better and more secure um about it now the one thing 
that I'm very personally keen on and where I sometimes wonder why there isn't much more talk of this is the whole idea of data privacy. You know, I mean, because that, that's one thing we can offer in this world that um, that I think is extremely important. And people don't still, despite Cambridge Analytica and all this other stuff, I don't think people are still necessarily aware of the extent to which they're being profiled and and how unnecessary and, and potentially dangerous that is. You know, and it, that's a hard story to tell. But if we can start to show, um, you know, show functioning self-sovereign identity, you know, where we have control of your own identity and stuff like that. Um, long story short, okay, when we figure out how to get, um, how people can get paid to watch ads, this thing is going to take off like a rocket. <laughs> Okay, so appeal to people's self-interest. Maybe that's one thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, in, in, in one in, in one instance, yes, but it's also fair. I think currently, right? I mean, it's when you said don't tell people it's about a blockchain. That's the opposite of what most companies do. I, I know what you're saying, and when I was saying it, I, 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 there, there was a bit of a paradox there, or a bit of a contradiction there. When, when any kind of important new technology comes in, people want to talk about it, whether it's a telephone or, or whether it's you know, whether it's uh, electric lighting in houses, and there's all sorts of stuff about how does it work and is it dangerous, and and you know, people. I mean, people didn't want to wire their houses for years because they, they thought it would, you know, they'd all burn down, right? Or when Edison invented the phonograph, the famous story is he, he, he you know, he couldn't find a use case for it, right? Um, you know, the, the music use case for, for, the, for, the, for, um, for vinyl records came about towards the end. First, he thought he'd use it for, you know, transcribing speeches and there would be, you know, it would bring transparency to government and, and, and accountability because we know what people said and all this other stuff. So you, you have to do that part. Right? You have to get up the story. There's something new going on, and this is how it works. That's laying a foundation. That's the part I'm involved in, the part I, the part I personally care about. You're asking me more about when, doing, when we're building the apps on top of it and the products on top of it, how do we deal with that? Well, then I think that there, the methods for doing that won't be much different than what we have now, but hopefully your decentralized application will have properties that an equivalent application that's not decentralized doesn't, and that's going to be your story. Mm -hmm. Cool. Makes a lot of sense. Tom, did you always want to work in communications? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I studied literature at university. So I suppose I actually never really wanted to work at all. <laughs> um, that's really kind of where I was coming from when I got out of school. But I, I, I realized rather quickly that that was not a viable um, life plan. So I, um, I, I, I got involved in communications and I got involved in banking because um, a little bit of, a little bit of by accident and a little bit of, you know, you know I was trained to be able to, 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 to read, um, think a little bit and write. And, you know, that's what communications offers you. I never, ever expected to get involved in banking. Um, and that was an accident. It was a fortuitous accident in many ways. I found um, over the years banking to be far more interesting than I ever expected um, because you're dealing with money and money's a very interesting topic. So there's that. Um, so I can't say I've ever expected it, but I don't regret it. If you, let's, I mean, let's assume you weren't working um, at Consensus Switzerland and in the communication field. Um, what, what else would you like to be doing? If I wasn't working in communications, yeah, that's that's a hard question because I, I like what I do. I I suppose I wouldn't mind doing something where I could I could do much more long form writing. I'd write, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd probably spend my day writing books, you know, and, and not having to worry about getting paid for them. That's likely what I would what I would like to. That's what I enjoy, um, and who knows, the day may come. Um, right now I'm happy with, with what I'm doing. Um, and I find it, it gets more and more interesting as, as, as my career goes on. If I was going to do something else, it would, it would be that, which is quite related to what I'm doing now. Tom, what is there, is there a thing that you'd like people to understand better about blockchain technology? Maybe not better, but there's, there's a, there's one thing I always like to keep in mind, and, and I think sometimes get lost when people like myself uh, talk about it. So I mean, I, I, 
I'm in the category of the idealists of blockchain, and I'm not a technologist, right? So I have to rely on people telling me how this thing works. And um, I can't really tell you if it's going to work, if all these things we've talked about today are really going to happen, and if we can build these structures, nor am I going to be able to tell you that if we build them, if they'll, if they'll actually function. Because it's one thing to have a... Um, a flat decentralized structure for whatever the thing is you're doing. It's the other thing. It's another thing to plug human beings into that and to see how they behave. That's a whole different discussion. So, um, my point is that I, I don't want to come across as saying these things are going to happen. Um, it is inevitable. It will, will happen where I come from every day when I get up and, and deal with this stuff is that I w there are important things that I would like to see happen. And that I think are important for the world. I think we have a problem right now with over, with, with centralization. We have a problem with centralization of power, with centralization of economic might. We have a problem with, um, with people losing, uh, losing faith in, in, in institutions who are not serving them well. Um, and we have a problem with, with, a, a very large problem with the, with the, um, aggregation of technological power in, in smaller and smaller hands. I can't tell you right now that blockchain is the answer for all of that, okay? But at least it shows a way, okay? And that's why I got into this thing because he looked at it and I said, look, at least here we have some sort of some sort of technological background. And again, we'll go back to this basic thing of sharing trusted information, okay? And we have a lot of people with this kind of vision. And I think that's important. That was really interesting, Tom. I, uh, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed this conversation. And many thanks for taking time today. It's always great talking to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. More info on our guests and our sponsors is in the show notes of this episode and on the podcast website, theblockchainandus.com. To help people find this podcast, it's important that you download, subscribe, and give it a top rating and review on iTunes or on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Manuel Staggers, and I thank you very much for listening.